All right, today we're going to talk about a second form of uh, inferential statistic. Uh, so the first one that we uh, looked at in the previous class was uh, estimation of mean or the population proportion, right? And that uh, means we construct the confidence interval for the population mean or the proportion if we're dealing with categorical data. Another way to do the uh, inferential statistics on one population is to test hypothesis. This topic is especially important because the rest of this semester we're going to be testing a lot of different forms and shapes and sizes of hypothesis. So we need to start learning what the hypotheses are, how to formulate them, and how to test them. Okay. Uh, let me skip to a new slide. All right, hypothesis testing actually was brought into statistics kind of from criminal justice system, okay? In criminal trial, if you uh, think about what happens in the court, well, there is a jury and there is a judge, and what they're trying to decide is, uh, let's say it's a criminal court, okay? So somebody was brought in front of the court and uh, the jury is trying to decide whether or not this person is guilty uh, or innocent of what he was accused of, right? So suppose he stole some property, right? But there is a question, did he do it? Well, neither of us was there, right? Or jury. Neither one of them was there. Judge also didn't say anything, okay? So if the person is innocent or guilty, they have no idea. They never met the gentleman or the lady, whoever that is, right? Bless you. So therefore... Uh, how can they uh, make a judgment? Well, they have to look at the uh, evidence, right? Obviously, whoever is accusing him of stealing, you know, money or property, they must have some evidence, you know, fingerprints or witnesses that saw him, right? Or recording from the video cameras or something like that, okay? So there should be something. You can't just bring a random person in front of the jury and say, hey, here is the thief, let's put him to jail, right? That, that doesn't happen uh, that way. Okay, so the jury really is trying to uh, decide between two uh, kind of alternate, two, two different hypotheses that are opposite, okay? So the null hypothesis that they have to begin with states that the defendant is innocent. You probably heard that phrase, innocent until proven guilty, right? It's, it, it's called presumption of innocence, right? So that's the basis of our judicial system, okay? Every person is innocent until proven otherwise. Uh, so that's the base hypothesis that they start, start with. The alternative hypothesis is opposite of what the null is, right? So null says that the defendant is innocent, so alternative should, sta should state the defendant is guilty as the scene itself, okay? So jury, when they begin, they don't know which one of them is correct. So uh, the, the verdict that they reach is based on the evidence, and that evidence should be fairly convincing, right? It's not enough to say, oh, somebody saw him, so it must be, that must be it, right? Uh, so there, there, there should be substantial evidence that is brought in front of the court in order for the jury to change their mind and say, yeah, we started by believing that this person is innocent. Now, based on what we've seen and heard, uh, you know, videotapes, witnesses, etc., etc. It looks like, beyond reasonable doubt, that this person indeed uh, performed this, you know, did, did what they claimed they did. So, uh, they choose between two hypotheses now, that they begin with, and the alternative. Uh, so, convic uh, convicting uh, the defendant is called, well, when, when we find that he is guilty, right? It's called rejecting the null. So null is the base statement, right? They begin by saying he's innocent. And then, uh, unless the accusing party will bring sufficient evidence in front of us, we're not changing our minds. So we're right now we believe that he's innocent and we stay on this ground, stand on this ground until we see enough evidence to, uh, to convince us to change our mind, right? So uh, convicting or changing the mind called rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of alternative hypothesis. In other words, the jury says that, hey, we've seen hard enough evidence, convincing enough evidence uh, to support the alternative hypothesis, the, the statement that the defendant is actually guilty. 
Well, another thing can happen, right? Let's say that accusing party that they did bring evidence as much as they could. They found some witnesses. They have some fingerprints that semi match what the defendant defendant's fingerprints are. So they they brought some evidence in front of the court, but the jury says, well, yeah, we, we hear what you're saying, but we just don't believe this is incriminating. This part, you didn't convince us, okay? You didn't do too good of a job convincing us. So therefore, how about that? We're going to say that this evidence was not hard enough, not incriminating enough. So therefore, we're not convinced, and therefore we're staying on our original point of view. So therefore, uh, the outcome of that is we fail to reject, uh, do I say it here on this slide? We fail to reject the null hypothesis, okay? Uh, now, true or false, uh, it may be that the defendant is actually guilty, but we find the evidence not incriminating and let him go. Can, can that be the case? It can, right? So if somebody is brought in front of the court, uh, and we looked at the evidence, but the evidence is not convincing enough, then we say, well, he may did what he did, what you say he did, or may not. We don't know. But this evidence just doesn't convince us, right? So we'll let him go. Um, uh, while, in fact, the person may be guilty, right? So therefore, we're not saying that we find that the null hypothesis that he is guilty or that, 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 that he is innocent, is true in this case, right? We don't know it. It may be false. It, he may be guilty, right? But the evidence is not incriminating enough, okay? So it can happen that uh, we fail to reject the null hypothesis in, in the cases when we actually should reject the null hypothesis and say that the defendant is guilty, right? So we never say that we accept the null hypothesis because accepting means that we believe 100% that this guy is innocent, right? We just fail to reject it. So we ju we're, we're saying, maybe guilty, maybe not. We didn't find hard enough evidence to say that he is guilty. So therefore, we're sticking with this first original statement. Okay. Now, uh, as we discussed, there are two types of errors that are possible. In fact, actually, you know what? Let me uh, draw kind of a table. All right. So uh, four possibilities. Okay. Now hypothesis, uh, now hypothesis, H0, actually, uh, what, what it's actually, is, is it true or is it false? It can be either true or false, right? So now hypothesis, uh, we're going to uh, denote as H sub zero. Sometimes it's also pronounced H naught, now hypothesis. So our now statement that the defendant is innocent, okay? So H uh, zero, actually, can be either true or false. Right? False. So that's what happens in actuality. Uh -huh. I'm going to write also on the top. So I'm going to create a table, I know. It, 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 it looks weird. I'm going to create a table. All right, our finding, okay? Our finding. can be that H uh, not is false, we reject it, or H not is true, okay? So this is what happens in reality, vertically, and this is what we conclude as a jury in hypothesis testing, okay? Now, uh, two of these squares are actually what's supposed to happen, right? For example, if uh, the null hypothesis is actually false, which means what? The defendant is guilty or innocent? So false. False. No. No. Yeah. Guilty, right? So if the guy is guilty, all right, and we find that the guy is guilty, we find that null is false, so therefore the guy is guilty. That's what's supposed to happen, right? The person is guilty, and we find him guilty. So this is the correct outcome of the proceedings, right? Another possibility can be that null is actually true, the defendant is innocent, right? And we find as a jury that the defendant is innocent. 
That is also what's supposed to happen, right? The person was innocent, and we concluded that the person is innocent. Okay? Sometimes, uh, the null hypothesis is true. The defendant is innocent, but we find that the null is false. So we uh, convict the guy, right? While he was innocent. That happens, because wrongly convicted, right? That's a bad situation, right? When we send to jail people who are actually innocent. And that is called type one error. Okay, so this situation when the null is true, but we reject it, is type one error. Okay. Or some, uh, sometimes it's also called, uh, called what, false uh, positive, right? No, that, that was false. false. Uh, which one is that? Our finding that the null is false. Neg false negative, right? That is false negative. Yeah. So that one is false negative. We rejected null hypothesis, and we shouldn't have rejected, right? So that's a false negative. Uh, otherwise, can also happen, right? If the uh, null was actually false, so in other words, the person was guilty or innocent, if null is false. Other way, right? Null says that the person is innocent. Alternative says it's guilty. So if actually null was false, so therefore he was not innocent but guilty, right? person is guilty. Uh, but we find that null is true. So he was innocent. Essentially, it was a criminal in front of us, right? But we let him go, right? We acquitted the person, right? And that is called type 2 error. Type 2 error. Or, alternatively, it's false positive, right? We're saying, yes, null is still true. We're positive on that. But that was actually false. So it was, it's false positive. Okay? And then actually, uh, also let me give you a couple of other examples. Flu tests, right? Sometimes you go to the doctor, you have symptoms, and uh, you know you have fever, you know the body aches and things like that. So you go to the doctor's office and they stick this long, long thing right in your nose, and then they run the test on it. Flu test, okay? Same thing. Uh, you have a flu. It can show that you have a flu. So that's basically. It's like an uh, alternative statement, right? That's a research hypothesis. That you have a flu, right? They're testing if you have a flu. If you have a flu and it shows that you have a flu, then we're talking about guilty and we find, find guilty, right? This situation. If you don't have a flu and the test shows that you do not have a flu, that's innocent, innocent situation, right? Alternatively, it can show that you have no flu while you actually do have a flu, okay? So uh, that would be type 2 error, right? False positive. You don't have a flu, uh, but it shows otherwise, right? Or alternatively, uh, if you don't have a flu, but it shows that you do have a flu, right? So that's the situation right there, okay? All right. So let's go back to our lectures. Uh, next slide. Type 1 error. The probability of type 1 error is our good old friend significance level, okay? So, whatever we pick is a significance level, we're going to test hypothesis at certain level of significance, okay? So, alpha, whatever we pick, significance level, is the likelihood of making a type 1 error, okay? Likelihood that the uh, defendant was uh, innocent, but we found, found that person guilty, type 1 error, okay? Uh, probability of type 2 error in statistics is denoted by the Greek letter B, okay? And uh, these two are inversely related, which actually is very easy uh, to understand. Uh, in other words, as I'm uh, increasing or as I'm decreasing the probability of type 1 error, the likelihood of type 2 error actually goes up. Uh, for example, let's say what does that mean? I'm decreasing type 1 error. Type 1 error meaning, uh, means that I'm going to convict innocent people, right? That's type 1 error, okay? And in the in judicial system, it's considered to be a very serious thing, okay? 
So uh, if I want to minimize the chance of that happening, I want to decrease alpha, right? Alpha gives me the probability of type 1 error. I want to keep type 1 error very, very limited at bay, okay? <clears throat> so what does that mean in terms of judicial proceedings? That means that I'm going to send people to jail only and only if uh, I have really incriminating evidence, right? Beyond reasonable doubt, that's you, you, the phrase you hear a lot, right? Evidence beyond reasonable doubt. That means that, man, everything points to this guy, right? We found his fingerprints, and we had 10 witnesses, and we had the video camera, and cops busted him, okay? With the loot, basically, right? So, it's like, there is no way that he is innocent. Like, the whole world saw what he did, okay? Then we sent him to jail. Only if the evidence is really flashing, okay? Then we convict people. Uh, but what does that do to other criminals that weren't caught in the act, okay? Well, what it does, basically, like, the jury wasn't struck, right? You have to reach the verdict. The person is guilty only if you saw really convincing stuff. If you're not sure, if there is something shaky or questionable, if you don't believe the testimony of the witness, he looks like, you know, he looks a shady guy, or anything like that, right? So then don't convict person, okay? Because that evidence is not hard and incriminating enough. What will happen if we're looking to minimize the type 1 error? Uh, if the evidence is not incriminating enough, then we're going to let the person go, right? Because we don't want to send, God forbid, innocent person to the jail, okay? So what, uh, what that will create is awkward situation when there will be criminals with not sufficient evidence and we're going to let them go, right? So therefore, the likelihood of type 2 error actually is getting higher, right? Type 2 error is when the person was guilty and we found them innocent, right? So minimizing type 1 error maximizes type 2 error and the other way around, right? So these two are kind of opposite of one another. Well, they have a reverse, uh, inverse relationship, okay? All right. Uh, uh, so... Like I said, type 1 errors are considered to be more serious. In fact, in criminal law, I believe it's dated to like 18th century, uh, there was an English prosecutor, William Blackstone, and that's the principle known in uh, judicial system as Blackstone's principle. But basically, it's, it's better uh, that 10 guilty persons escape than one innocent person suffers. So in other words, we should put people to jail very rarely when there is truly, truly horrific, significant evidence against them. That would be minimizing type 1 error, right? Uh, convicting people who are innocent. Okay, so uh, burden of proof lies on the prosecution. That means that court doesn't have to do anything until they see enough incriminating evidence, right? Before that happens, they still stand on null hypothesis that this person is innocent because Everybody is innocent until proven guilty. And only if we see uh, bad enough evidence, then we're going to maybe change our mind. Okay? That's hypothesis testing. So, to summarize, that's what we're going to be doing, actually, for pretty much the rest of the semester. When we begin testing of the hypothesis, and now I'm not talking just criminal proceedings, you know, legal system, courts. Uh, in general, in statistics, that's going to be our approach. There are two hypotheses, null and alternative. Uh, the procedure begins by believing that the null is true. person is innocent, for example, right? Our goal is to determine if the evidence that we have in front of us is bad enough, incriminating enough, to reject null and find it uh, in favor of alternative hypothesis. So, there are two possible outcomes of this process, right? Outcome number one is, if there is enough evidence, and we say we reject the null, in favor of alternative. We change our mind. Believe that the person is innocent, now we believe that he's guilty. Or, the second possible outcome, if evidence is not bad enough, not incriminating enough, we're going to say, we believed now to begin with, and we continue to believe the now. An alternative, we didn't see enough evidence to support that. So, in this case, we fail to reject the now. So, two outcomes, we either reject the now, or fail to reject the now. So, it all revolves around the null hypothesis, right? Okay, now let's switch gears. We talked about legal system, judicial system. How does that uh, relate to back to statistics, our subject at hand? Well, it's 
kind of very similar process. The only thing is, um, we're studying populations, right? And what do we study about populations? I told you before, the holy grail of all statisticians when it comes to the population's data is to know the population parameters, right? Such as mean, standard deviation, different percentiles, first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, are there any outliers? So characterize population with maybe a dozen of different numbers, right? Well, unfortunately, that is not happening, right? For the reasons that we discussed. Very expensive, very time-consuming, impractical, sometimes even impo plain impossible to get to get the results, the accurate data, okay? So therefore, whatever it is that we want to compute about the population, we'll never ever get that. The only thing is we have a sample, right? Statisticians settle for samples. Sample is your evidence. It's like in the criminal court. If we believe something about, you know, uh, if we believe that person stole money, we should have evidence. We can't just go to court and say, hey, I don't like that guy, okay? He looks like he could be a thief, right? So therefore, let's, let's see if we can convict him. Now, you have to have an evidence, right? So our evidence, uh, in case of hypothesis testing, uh, when it comes to statistics, is your sample. And from the sample, you can compute X bar, or proportion, P hat, anything that, uh, you know, comes from, from the data, okay? Uh, so after that, this evidence, uh, we're going to test it in order to see if we support the null hypothesis about the parameters of the population or not support the null hypothesis and reject that in favor of alternative, okay? So our statement is not going to be that, you know, the defendant is guilty or innocent. It's going to be about population, you know, things that we compute, such as population mean population proportion. We believe that the population mean is greater than 5. Do we have enough evidence to support that statement? Let's collect a sample, let's get X bar, and see if X bar actually supports our point of view, okay? So that's the idea. Very similar to what the criminal courts are doing, uh, but now we're just testing population parameters, proportions or means, okay? So that's the idea how uh, that uh, human practice from the criminal court system applies to the statistical data. All right, so as we discussed, we uh, have to formulate two statements, null and alternative. Null pronounced, uh, I guess it's English way to H naught, null hypothesis, okay? Typically I just say null hypothesis. Alternative sometimes it's denoted H1 as opposed to H0, sometimes it's denoted HA, A stands for alternative. And uh, here is the general rule of thumb that uh, we need to use, basically, when formulating null and alternative statements. Null represents status quo. Status quo is something that makes us feel comfortable, so to speak. When the world is organized the way it's supposed to be, okay? Everybody should be innocent in the world, right? That's the ideal society. It's like utopia kind of thing, right? Uh, everybody should be innocent, and wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be great? Yes, it would. So that would be status quo, right? Alternatively, not everybody is innocent. Some people did something, right? They stole some money, you know, that kind of stuff. So that would be our research statement. So a research statement or alternative statement is something that we want to investigate and maybe prove based on the evidence that we are able to collect. It's like the uh, Shawshank Redemption. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody here is innocent. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right. Uh, also, uh, now and alternative combined together should cover all the range of possibilities. Well, for the criminal court, it covers it, right? It's a binary decision. The person is either, either guilty or they're not. That's it. These two possibilities are mutually exclusive. And taken together, they cover the full range of possibilities, right? Well, in statistics, it's, it's a little bit different, but we're going to discuss that in just one second. All right. So, for example, let's say I'm running a milk company, right? You've seen milk in stores, right? It's sold in these one-gallon jugs, plastic jugs, right, with a handle. Uh, so, where does that milk come from? From the milk plant, right? So, they, have, they, they buy milk in bulk, obviously. They buy the plastic bottles, these jugs, 
And then they have a production line, basically the jugs move along the conveyor belt, and there is a valve that opens and closes, right, and it measures one gallon, and then it seals the, the, uh, the bottle and puts a cap on the top of that. Okay, so when the, well, we discussed it actually, uh, true or false, every single jug contains precisely one gallon, no less and no more. False, right, because there are these micro variations, right, all the time. Uh, valve shuts off millisecond later, millisecond earlier, that makes a difference, right? Then there is a milk buildup or something, the residue buildup in the valve, it gets the stream, you know, uh, less of what it used to be, so now you're putting less than average in every jug. Um, so there are all kinds of variations in place that make different bottles to look different. But uh, what's important is that my average the label says basically there is one gallon of product inside. Of course, I cannot make every bottle to contain one gallon of milk, right? It's just physically impossible. There's going to be always variability. But if, for example, uh, me as, as a uh, foreman of the plant, if my goal is to keep the average at 1.0, that would be great. That, that would mean that I'm on target pretty much. On average, some bottles go underfilled. Some bottles go overfill, but on average, I'm staying on target 1.0. Uh, that, that's my goal, right? So therefore, remember from the previous slide, a couple of slides, null hypothesis, oh, I forgot where it was, yeah, here. Null hypothesis represents status quo. So in other words, statement about the world that should make, make me comfortable and should make most sense, right? Well, what makes me comfortable as a foreman is to know that on average, I put one gallon in all of my jugs, right? That's my goal, pretty much. So therefore, uh, mean equal to 1.0 is my null statement. Alternatively, I can say, well, mean is not equal to 1.0. And not equal means what? It can be either higher than 1 or lower than 1, right? Either way, it's bad. Differently, but bad. If it's above uh, 1, it's bad for me, right? It's good for customers because they're getting more product for their money, right? But it's bad for me because I'm operating on the razor thin margin of profit and I've, if I'm giving the product away, I may be actually starting to lose money, right? So it's bad for the business. But if I'm uh, on the other end of the of the fence, if it me mean is less than one, it's good for me, right? Essentially I'm charging for one gallon but giving away less than a gallon, but it's bad for customers because they're not getting their money's worth. So either way it's bad, okay? So my research statement in this case, if I'm suspecting that I'm not on the target, that would be my research statement. Mean is not one. It's either above or below, but it's not one. Okay? That would be analogous to the math statement, the visa top. Mm-hmm. math statement. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Uh, and look at that. What, what happens is, well, let me actually uh, draw that right. new page. What happens is, uh, this is the list of all the possibilities that the mu can be, right? <laughs> My uh, null hypothesis says that the mu is 1.0. 1 1.0, 1 right? That's my null. And alternative says it's not 1.0, which means it can be below, up to, an, uh, but excluding one, right? Or above, down to an excluding one, again. So therefore, here's my alternative. All the numbers that are below, excluding one, and all the numbers that are above and excluding one. And if you put these two together, what you get is entire line, right? So combination of your null and alternative covers all full range of possibilities, okay? So let's call this form of null and alternative form number one. Null contains equal sign, equals, and alternative is not equal. So that's form number one. Let's uh, look at yet another possibility. What if, for example, uh, one of my customers, I'm, I'm not selling these jugs to people, I'm selling these jugs to retail stores, right? So my customers really are other businesses. So one of my retailers that buys milk from me calls me up and, and they say, oh, look, uh, we have a lot of complaints from our customers. They buy milk when they open this bottle, 
they see that visibly the level is low. So they're threatening to stop buying milk from us. Can you can you look at your production process and see if you are um, uh, if you're doing things right? Because it looks like you're underfilling your your jobs. Okay? Can you do that for me, please? So uh, in this case, what am I researching? I'm researching the statement that I'm underfilling the jugs, right? So therefore, my alternative becomes that the uh, mean amount of milk that I put in my bottles is less than one. Okay? And it's easier to formulate uh, alternative first, by the way. So that's pretty much how we're going to do all the exercises, all the problems. First, you read the problem, and you find out from reading the problem what is that we're trying to investigate? What is our research statement? Okay? And that becomes your alternative. And after that, reverse that, and that becomes your null. So my alternative says that the mean is less than 1.0. What's the reverse of that? That the mean is 1.0 or above, right? So therefore, I start with alternative that I'm underfilling jugs. So here's my alternative, mu less than 1. And then after that, I basically reverse that and say, well, greater than or equal to 1, that becomes my null. And again, Look at that. The list of uh, com the null and the alternative combined give me the full list of possibilities, right? So this is my form one, right? Equal, not equal, form one. Then my another form of null and alternative would be here is my 1.0, uh, 1.0. So my alternative reads that I am underfilling jugs. In other words, my possibilities for the mu include all numbers up until one, but not including one, right? And when I create the reverse statement, the alternative says that it's one or above. Okay, so this is my uh, alter uh, alternative, and this is my noun. And combined together, I again get the full uh, horizontal line, right? Full range of possibilities. So let's call it form two of null and alternative. Finally, let me get back to slides. Finally, let's say my quality control people in the same uh, company that I'm working come to me and say, hey, uh, we picked a bunch of random bottles, you know, we have to inspect them randomly before we send them out. So we were uh, opening some bottles you know, purely randomly just pick, pick some of them and open them up and measure the content. And it looks like you're overfilling your bottles. I don't know what it is. Maybe your equipment is out of tune or something like that. So you should look at the timing on your, you know, dial settings at, at the uh, machine that fills up the bottles. So can you please check, the, uh, check that? Uh, because it looks like we're giving away product on average, right? So therefore, my research hypothesis is going to be that I'm overfilling bottles on average, and my mean is greater than one, okay? And I reverse that statement and get the null, and the null says that it's one or less, okay? So in other words, here's my third, diff third possibility, okay? For all possible values that the mean can take, I believe that I might be overfilling the uh, jugs, right? So therefore, mean greater than one, that all the numbers up to n excluding one, right? That's my alternative hypothesis, H1. And my null is what alternative is not, that it's one or below. So all numbers to the left from one, n including one, that's my now hypothesis, okay? So let's call it form three. So now an alternative can take three forms. Equal, not equal. Then I have uh, this one. My now sta states uh, greater than or equal to one, an alternative less than one, right? And this one now states less than or equal to one, an alternative greater than. So three different forms, okay? Now, what do you know uh, about these forms? Here's my form one, equal, not equal. Here's my form two, greater than or equal, less than. And here's form three, less than or equal, greater than. What do you notice about form one, two, and three? What's common between them? 
more specifically, look at the null statement. What's common among all these null statements? Mm -hmm. All the null statements contain equal part. So, that's pretty much a way to check yourself if you recorded your null and alternative correctly. Your equal to should always end up in the null hypothesis, in the null statement. Okay? All right, so let's, let's practice. Let's have some practice. I'm going to actually type it right here as you give me the answers. So, first things first, what we're going to do is uh, try to practice, if we can spot the alternative hypothesis and formulate our null statement, H0, and our alternative statement, H1. Which one do we begin with, by the way? Null or alternative? Alternative, right? We formulate the alternative first. So, let's uh, read this thing. Random sample of 100 adult men was selected. Each person was asked how many minutes of sports they watched on TV daily. Which hypothesis, now an alternative, should we test to see if there is enough statistical evidence to conclude that mean amount of TV watched daily is greater than 50 minutes? So, as Patrick is saying, we start with alternative. What's the research statement that we're trying to investigate? Greater than 50 minutes, right? That's the purpose of the study, okay? So, therefore, I'm going to just type mu is, you know what? Uh, let me see if I can change that thing into the Greek. Right, so that should be changed to symbol. Like that, okay. That the mean mu is greater than 50. Okay, that's my null. And therefore, alternative becomes mean is what? Less than or equal to 50, right? Less than or equal to 50. Okay? So that's my null and alternative. Make sense? In this problem. Okay, second problem. And again, we're going to formulate null and alternative. So this is my null, this is my alternative H1. Can you go back to the last slide? Sure. Yep. I mean, greater than 50, that's my alternative. Because that's the question imposed in the problem. And the inverse of that is the null. Okay? All right. Second problem. Uh, random sample of 87 students from CNU enrolled in this course, Statistical Thinking BUSN 231, was taken. Each student was asked how many hours he or she spent doing homework in statistics. Instructor recommends that the total homework time should be at least five hours. That means five hours or more than that, right? But uh, the instructor suspects that students actually spend less time than what he recommends. Test to determine whether there is enough evidence to infer that the average student spend less than the recommended amount of time. So again, we start with alternative. What do you think I should write? What's the research that I'm performing in this problem? What do you think? What's the purpose of the study? To see if there is enough evidence to conclude that the students spend at least five hours? Well, that's, what, that's what's recommended, right? But there is a suspicion. The instructor suspects that they actually don't do that. And that becomes my research statement, right? I ask 87 students, students, how many hours per week you spend doing the statistics homework, right? And they give me different answers. The purpose of the study is to see if they're spending less than what, than the minimum recommended, right? So therefore, mean is less than five is what I suspect, and that's why I'm collecting the data, right? I suspect that it's less than the recommended amount of time. So that's the purpose of the study. And the null, remember, status quo. Status quo means recommended. Well, so students act according to the instructor's recommendations. What the instructor recommends that the mean amount of time should be greater than or equal to five, right? In this case, you will be successful in statistics course, okay? 
So that's status quo. That's the statement that makes instructors comfortable and feeling warm, right? <laughs> but if, it, if it's less, that's a red flag. And that becomes my research statement, right? Make sense? Okay, cool. Finally, uh, the last problem is about uh, ball bearings. You know what ball bearings are, right? It's like a mechanical thing that has outer ring and internal ring, right? Metal rings. And between them, they, it has the uh, lubrication, and sometimes it's like metal cylinders, sometimes it's metal balls, right? But the idea is that these two rings rotate very freely, right? Uh, around, uh, basically, each other, okay? So, uh, a machine that makes the ball bearings is set to make the metal balls uh, with a precise, very pre should be very precise diameter, 0.5 inch. But we discussed that. You can't make two identical things, right? You can't make two identical cans of food, cat, uh, cat food, or two identical ball bearings, right? There should be a micro, you know, variations from one ball to another ball, right? So we can't make them precise, uh, one like another, but we should, uh, we should at least uh, make sure that the machine is set at 1.5 inches no more than that and no less than that. What will happen if diameter of the metal balls is too large, it's, if it's greater than 0.5? You will not fit the balls between the rings, right? You, you will not be able to cram them. And even, in, even if you will, it will be tension, right? So basically like mechanical uh, strain. So therefore, uh, the bearing probably will disintegrate sooner or later, right? It will just break apart. Uh, what if the diameter of the uh, metal balls that you're using in the bearings is average less than 0.5? Then the system is going to be too loose, right? So there's going to be like a gap between the rings, uh, and therefore the, the, the bearing is not going to be stable, right? As, the, as it's being used, it's going to basically vibrate and probably eventually again fall apart, right? So it should be pretty much on target, 0.5. More than 0.5 is bad. Less than 0.5 is bad. We should be precisely at 0.5, right? So we take a sample of 10 ball bearings, take them apart, get the uh, metal balls out of that, and we measure diameter of every one of these uh, metal balls, right? I don't know where 3 comes from. It's just a typo here, okay? Can we conclude at 5% significance level that the uh, mean diameter is not 0.5? So again, give me the null and give me the alternative. I start with alternative, right? The alternative should say what? Not equal, yep. So the mean diameter of the metal ball is not equal to 0 0.5 inches, right? That's my research statement. That would be bad, right? Differently bad, but bad. If it's more than 0.5, it's bad. If it's less than 0.5, it's also right. bad. And now the status quo, what makes the world right, is if the mean is precisely on target, 0.5 inches. No more than that, and not less than that. That's what makes it right. Agree? Very good. Very good. All right. Um, uh -huh. Do we have to worry about the significance level? Thing? Yes, significance level will come to the play. But not at what we're doing. No, 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 not right now. So, uh, the, the oh, I understand. This extra piece of information uh, where does it come from and how do we use it right now, right? When we formulate the hypothesis, we don't, okay? But when we test and conclude the hypothesis testing, that's where the significance level will come to the play, okay? And that actually deals with how do we conclude the hypothesis testing, okay? So here is uh, another piece of information. So we're going to basically go through all the theory behind the hypothesis testing, and then we're going to do a bunch of actually hypothesis testing ourselves, okay? So, uh, first thing first is we have to formulate the null and the alternative. And we formulate alternative first. And how do we do that? You read the state of the problem and you look for the research statement, right? What is that we're trying to investigate? That becomes your alternative. And you reverse that statement, that becomes your null, right? Now what happens after that? Well, as we discussed, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, once the uh, null and alternative hypothesis are stated, 
as we discussed, basically, it's like testing hypothesis in the court, right? A person can be guilty or innocent, but we, we start by believing that the person is innocent, right? So, just like in the court, in statistical hypothesis testing, same thing happens. When we start testing the hypothesis, we believe the null, okay? And moreover, we saw that there are three forms of null, right? Form number one, null and alternative. Form number one was equal, not equal. Form number two was greater than or equal, alternative less. And form number three, less than or equal, and alternative greater, okay? Uh, and what we discussed also, that null always contains the equality sign. So, out of all these possibilities, we always start by saying that the null is true, and moreover, we pick only a, an equal sign, okay? So, we always start testing with a mu equal to a number. That's the basis for all of our judgment is going to be. Now, how exactly do we test hypothesis? Let's see... Uh, we calculate the p-value. Remember I told you that in the court, evidence is whatever it can be, right? Fingerprints, videotapes, mm, witnesses, right? Uh, saying something, right? Their testimony. Uh, in statistics, your evidence is the sample, right? We're testing something about the population mean or about the population proportion. The only thing that you have at your disposal is a sample, right? You're you want to see if tires last at least 40,000 miles. Well, you get 250 tires and measure every one of them. How long does it last? That's your evidence, essentially, right? That you're using in order to support your alternative or not support your alternative and stick with your null, okay? So whatever, whatever it is, whatever our evidence is, it's coming from the sample. So from the sample, we uh, conclude X bar, for example, we compute X bar, right? We're testing hypothesis about the mean, but from the sample, we compute the sample average X bar. Well, here is the idea on the informal level. If X bar is going to be close to the mean in my null, then what am I going to say? Uh, null is likely true or alternative is likely true? Let's say, for example, let's go back to this uh, example with students, right? Students are supposed to spend at least five hours, you know, um, studying, right? Let's say I take 87 students and ask them, how many hours do you spend weekly? And I find that weekly they spend four point, on average, of course, right? 4.95 hours. Is that close to five or is it not close to five? Pretty close, right? So, and my now says that the uh, amount of time the students spend studying should be five or more. So 4.95 is close, so therefore, will I, uh, will I find in favor of null or alternative? Where null says five, five or more hours. Re reasonably close to five, right? So I'm gonna say, yeah, it's consistent with five, so I'm okay, right? What if I took 87 numbers from students, averaged them out, and it turns out to be 4.1 hour? And probably I'm going to say, wow, that is actually very low, right? It cannot be just a random fleek, just, you know, unlucky sample, okay? Probably it's a sign that actual mean is below 5, right? And therefore, I find in favor of my alternative in this case, okay? So essentially, how do I conclude the hypothesis testing is very simple. I calculate X bar, and then I'm going to compute the p-value. Now, I'm going to say something that will not make much sense, all right? But you should make a tattoo, <laughs> so that permanent, <laughs> permanent. Uh, so every time when somebody asks you what's the meaning, what's the interpretation of the p-value, you will always have a frame of reference. You look at your tattoo and say, ah, there it is, okay? My p-value, this is how I interpret that. So here is the general interpretation, okay? P-value uh, of a test hypothesis, of hypothesis, right, is the probability to observe the test statistic as extreme, at least as extreme as the one that you see, or even more extreme than that, provided that the null is true. Remember, every time when we test hypothesis, we start by saying that null is true. Defendant is innocent. That's what we believe in, right? Same thing when you test hypothesis about the mean or proportion. Null is true. So this statement doesn't make much sense, probably, right? 
p-value is the probability to see a value that you see, or even more extreme, if the null is true. Okay? We're going to get more specific as we go to examples, okay? and you will see precisely what that means. So this is a general statement every time when you test hypothesis, and I will actually assign homework like that. You have to interpret the p-value. Okay? So remember that p-value is the probability. That's it. Okay, when I took a course in statistics, when I was in the PhD program, uh, our professor used to tell us, okay, this is pretty much how he graded homeworks and, and, and tests. So when he asked questions like that, interpret the probability, a lot of students started to say, well, p-value is less than alpha, therefore we reject the null, we not reject the null. No. That's how you conclude okay, the, the hypothesis testing. Interpretation of p-values. P-value is the probability to see what you see in the sample, or even more extreme than that, if the null is true. Okay, that's it. P-value is the probability. That's interpretation. So, um, and here is how we conclude the hypothesis. P-value is likelihood to see the sample average that you observe, right? If the p-value is very small, and we're going to say, wow, what I'm seeing is far away from the mean that I hypothesized, right? The probability of that thing that I'm observing is very small. So I have two choices. Choice number one is to say, null is still true, and what I witnessed is a very rare event, very unlikely sample, right? Which is far away from the mean. But I still believe in null. So essentially what I'm saying is, I just witnessed almost a miracle, right? Null still stands, but what I'm seeing is very unlikely for that, for that mean, for that null hypothesis. But I'm still going to believe in null and claim that what happened is a very rare event, miraculous event, okay? Or, probably a more reasonable approach is to say, wow, that's too far away. Not a lot of samples are like that. They're unlikely to see that sample purely by randomly, by accident. So I'm going to say that null that I believed in probably is not true, because typically miracles do not happen to us regular people, right? So therefore, I'm going to reject the null, okay? So if the probability of seeing what you're seeing is, le is small, we're rejecting the null in favor of alternative. And if probability is not small, we're keeping the null, very simple. Now, the question, of course, is what do we mean by large probability and by small probability, right? For example, let me ask you this question. If probability of something 0 0.5, 50, 50, is it large probability? Yeah, pretty large, right? What if likelihood of something is 30%? Is that a large probability? Yeah, 30% chance of that happening, right? That's a lot. If probability of something is 15%, is that a lot? And now we're getting into this judgment area, right? 15% its like one out of, what, seven chances, right, of seeing that thing. Now we're getting into this rare event area, right? Probability, 7%. Pretty small, right? So, how do we judge what is small and what is large? And the answer is, we have to pick for ourselves the yardstick against which we measure the probabilities, right? So, therefore, it's kind of a judgment call, right? A lot of statisticians make this judgment call. The standard judgment call, what's, what's to call small probability, is, guess what? 0 0.05. That's the standard value of the significance level that we discussed, okay? So if my probability is larger than 0.05, 5%, I'm going to call it not small. If the probability of something is less than 5%, normally I would call it small. Okay, 0 0.035, 3.5%, small probability. So uh, significance level that we pick is essentially the decision point, right? Is the p-value small or is p-value not so small? So, Patrick, to answer your previous question, where does the significance level come into the play? At the final stage of the hypothesis testing. First, we formulate hypothesis, then we compute the p-value for what we're observing in the sample, and then we're saying, is that p-value small or is that p-value large? If it's small, we reject the null. If it's large, we fail to reject the null, and we compare it against significance level. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> simple rule that we're going to use, and that's your second tattoo, okay? Should be second tattoo, okay? So first one, remind you, p-value is the probability to see what you see, or more extreme than that if the null is true, right? And the second reminder, which is true for all tests that we're going to conduct, okay? No matter how complicated the test might be, how weird it may look, 
That's the rule that we're going to use. If p-value is low, we reject null. If p-value is not low, what do we do? We keep the null, right? We fail to reject the null. Remember, two outcomes. You either reject the null or you don't. So this is how you do it. P-value is small, you reject the null. P-value is not small, you keep the null. Simple as that. And like I said, uh, how do we judge? High p-values versus low p-values, we compare that against alpha, significance level. Anything less than significance level, null is getting rejected. If p-value is greater than the significance level, null is being kept. Okay? All right. So now we're ready to start with some specific examples. Do you want to take a short break before we do that? Okay. Recharge the batteries a little. Okay. So let's take a look at several examples of application of these rules and principles that we just discussed. Okay? And these examples are going to be linked with business. This is a business statistics course, right? So everything we do should be somehow linked to the business context. Well, at least it's a nice idea. So example <laughs> number one comes from accounting area. Uh, department store manager uh, would like to consider replacing their uh, current accounting information system, well, manual, for example, accounting, right? A lot of companies have manual accounting. You just uh, record transactions, you do the debits and credits, but that's inefficient, right? Uh, accounting information systems, uh, they were converted a long time ago into the computer-based systems, right? So uh, a department store manager would like to see if uh, the company wants to replace their existing system with the electronic one with computer based. Now, uh, that would be cost effective only if uh, there is enough uh, job to, to be done, there is enough work to be done in, in bookkeeping, right? So that means that a lot of different transactions, so therefore automating would make most sense. So he determines that the system will be cost effective only if the average monthly balance of any account in the organization is over $170. If that's the case, the average uh, monthly balance is more than 170 bucks, then uh, the company will benefit. Otherwise, they probably want to stick with their old manual paper-based record keeping, okay? So, in order to see if a uh, decision should be made to switch to a new accounting information system, what he does is takes 400 uh, accounts uh, monthly, and calculates their balance. And the balances are recorded in the file. Can we conclude that the new system will be cost effective or not? All right, so let's go to Scholar, right? Scholar, oops. Scholar, right there. I believe I just changed my password. So let's see if I can remember that. Yeah, today they have this thing, right? Okay, let's see if that's the right password. Yep, it is. Update, okay. Good, so let's take a look at the file first. Go to the jump data sets, and one of the sets that you will find there is accounts jump. Go ahead and download that. All right, and open it up. And there, there it is. So let's close keep of the day. Jump home window. Let's close that one. Exit jump. All right. So here, here is my set of accounts. And you can see 400 is the sample size, right? Well, first things first. Uh, before we start getting into the specifics, uh, every time when uh, we test hypothesis, it's pretty much a good idea to look at the X bar, just to see, uh, oh, well, actually, even before, even before we get to X bar, let's take a step back, and let's formulate the null and alternative, because null and alternative, you don't need actually to see the data to formulate the null and alternative. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you this question. Again, 
Which hypothesis do we start with now or alternative? Alternative, right? So here's my now, here's my alternative. And what am I testing? If it's more than 170, that's exactly right. That's the research, the research statement, right? So the mean greater than 170 is my alternative, right? If that is true, by the way, what does that imply in terms of the information system? Should I stick with the old one or install new? Install new, right? Install new, whoops, <laughs> look at that. That's uh, Greek, right? So times new. Um, and install new accounting information system, okay? And my now, therefore, becomes what? Mean less than or equal to 170. So if that's the case, what, what I should do is uh, keep the old one, right? Keep the old system, okay? Even before I looked at any data. That's the first thing, right? Formulate your now and alternative. All right, good. Now that we know what we're looking for, we're looking for high balances, right? Balances in excess of $170 on average, right? So the best thing that we have is, of course, a sample, right? So like I say, if you suspect uh, a fire, there should be a smoke, right? This is what we're suspecting. At least we would like to see that, right? that the mean is greater than 170. So there should be a smoke pointing us towards alternative hypothesis, right? And the smoke comes in the form of X bar, of course, right? So, uh, therefore, let's go back to jump. Here is my data set. All right, uh, let's go ahead and create a distribution. So I take all the accounts and I create the distribution. Okay, and let me put it in the stack form. Okay, what's X bar? My X bar among these 400 accounts is $177.9965. So let's call it $178, okay? So back to my hypothesis, now on the alternative. Does it look like we have a support for alternative hypothesis? Yes, it does, right? X bar is 178 which is clearly greater than 170, right? So the only thing is, is that number far away enough from 170 to claim the difference? Because what can happen is, my balance, average balance, can be still 170, not more, but exactly 170, or even less than that. Uh, and I could get this uh, random sample of 400 accounts uh, just purely accidentally. You know, the selection of numbers in that sample can be it can just happen to be on the high side, right? So therefore, I could, could have ended up with this average of $178 in my sample purely by accident, while now, in fact, is still the case. Can it happen? Yeah, purely accidentally, right? So therefore, uh, remember what uh, we, we discussed. Uh, we start uh, the hypothesis test by believing that the null is true. So let me go ahead and illustrate that concept with a picture. So I'm going to make a new page. All right, so if the null is true and my mean is truly $170, not more than that, then here is the distribution of all possible sample averages. And that's where the sampling distribution comes in actually. Remember what happens in the sampling distribution? You start taking samples and calculate sample averages. Average are distributed, are distributed with the same mean as the original population, right? Remember? Sampling distribution. It was rule number two, I believe. Rule number one is sample, uh, population is normal, sampling is normal, right? Rule number two is means are the same for the population and for the sampling distribution. So if this is my mean for the population, it's going to be also... Wow, that's ugly. Okay, hold on. <coughs> is going to be also the mean for my sampling distribution, right? So essentially, what I'm saying is, here is how all the X bars are going to be distributed, sample averages, right? And that is assuming that null is true. 
because my mean is 170 and that is exactly what my null says, right? Mean is 170 or less, okay? Now, the sample that I happen to have is on the high side, right? So it's right here somewhere. And it has X bar specifically equal to 178, okay? So remember, how do we define the p-value? We discussed it, right? Let me go back to the slides and point that out. We discussed that p-value, where is it? Yeah, right there. No. Okay, hold on. Yeah, p-value here. That's what I'm, what I'm shooting for. The p-value is the probability. Yep, that's the probability of observing uh, what, what you see, test statistic, X bar, at least as extreme as the one that you have, or even more extreme, if the null hypothesis is true. So, specific to the context of this problem, what do we mean by p-value? Well, here is what I observed, 178. If the null is true, then the center of the distribution must be 170, right? So, what do I mean by as extreme as that, or even more extreme. More extreme means that happened to be a high number, right? So more extreme than that means in the right tail of the distribution, right? If the null is true. So therefore, this shaded area is likelihood to see sample average of 178 or more, provided that the null is true and the actual true average is 170, okay? So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the p-value. P-value. Probability to see what you see in your sample, or even more extreme than that, if the null is in fact true. Make sense? And if this probability is large, then I keep the null, because this sample is consistent with the null, right? If the probability is small, I'm going to say, well, <laughs> it's too far away, so therefore I reject the null, okay? not likely to see that if now is still the case. That's basically the intuition kind of behind, behind uh, hypothesis testing. But let's go ahead and do the hypothesis testing. So let's go back to jump. Uh, where is it? Right here, jump. And hypothesis testing is done very simple and very straightforward. So I go to the, you probably guessed, it, red triangle, right? And the red triangle tells me, test the mean. I'm just test the mean, yeah. And what it says is specify what you want in the null, and in my null I want what? 170, right? Enter true standard deviation if you're running the z-test. Do we know the true standard deviation? No. no, we don't know anything about the population, right? Sample is the only thing that we have. So therefore, we're not going to enter anything, and therefore it's going to use the t-test, okay, for this hypothesis testing. And we just say OK, and there it is. OK? And uh, note that it's actually doing multiple t tests for us. We just need to pick the right one. OK? So uh, look at that. It calculated the t statistics for us. So t, t ratio, right? x bar minus the mean divided by s over square root from n. That's basically what it is. <coughs> and it says, well, you're, you're trying to test 170. 170 is right here, my friend, okay? Graphically, it's right here. So, uh, first thing it reports, uh, no, second thing it reports, probability greater than T. So, in other words, every, everything in the right tail of the distribution. And then also, uh, it computes, you can see, the value on the other end of the spectrum, right? Symmetrical value for my... Uh, sampling distribution, right? So this one is 170, and this one is 163, actually. It's a symmetric with respect to, to the center, 170. Okay, so this one is, uh, well, 178. So this one, so 170 plus 8 gives you 178. And here you subtract the 8, so this value is actually 162, right? So it gives you uh, probability in the right tail, greater than T. Probability in the left tail, less than t, in other words, uh, this area is not shown here, but it's on the left from 178. So this big area, okay? And it also gives you the two-tail uh, probability, right? So two-tail means this uh, 
left uh, this right tail anything to the right from 178 and anything to the left from 162 value symmetric with respect to the center of the distribution okay so which one do we pick right tail left tail or two tails kind of comes back to this picture right we pick the right tail okay so therefore probability greater than t is the thing that we have to use that's our p value 0 0.0099 okay so my p value is equal to 0 0.0099 right there and the next of course is how do i conclude the hypothesis right what do I do? I compare p-value against alpha, right? P-value against alpha. Which alpha do I use in this question, by the way? Do I know? Does the problem tell me anything which alpha to use? No. No. So what do we use by default? 5%, 0 0.05, right? So 0 0.05. P-value is less than alpha. If p-value is less than alpha, what do we do with null and alternative? Yeah, now, now, now it has got to go, right? If p-value is smaller than alpha, we have enough evidence in the sample to reject the null in favor of alternative. So therefore, coming back to my uh, null and alternative, I reject x out. Let me put it in the back fat uh, cross. I reject the null in favor of alternative, right? So my, uh, I have a statistical confirmation that the average uh, balance of the account in my accounting system is higher than 170. Very likely higher than 170, right? So therefore, I have to probably look into installing a new system, right? I have a confirmation that uh, my average balances are high enough to justify the cost of installing new accounting information system. Make sense? How did you get your lower? I'm sorry. Lower... Uh huh. And then it, you said it was 162. Yeah. I'm failing to figure that one out. Oh, that that value is just uh, same same distance from the center. So this is 178. Yeah. As you subtract. Subtract. Yeah. In fact, in the next question, where, uh, that actually is going to come to play. All right. So this uh, this problem we tested the right tail of the distribution because our alternative was greater than 170, right? So it's a directional test. Here it's testing for specifically high numbers, so, okay? So unlike Visa, uh -huh. this does not tell you, Jump does not tell you whether a distribution is normal or not. Yeah, but we're about to test that. Oh, oh we're going to, okay. Yeah. We're about to address, and that, that's actually a very, very good point, okay? Uh, and I believe, yeah, this, this is the part where, that we just did. But now checking your required condition, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, checking required condition. Remember, when we discussed confidence intervals uh, for population mean, we mentioned that if the, uh, the distribution of your sample is weird, meaning it's highly skewed to the right, or highly skewed to the left, or bimodal, some, something that's not bell-shaped, then the whole notion of the mean is kind of a moot point, right? Because... If you have two uh, peaks in the distribution, where is the mean? In between, or in peak number one, or in peak number two, it kind of becomes very shady idea to use the mean, right? So therefore, this whole idea about m testing for the mean and constructing the confidence interval for the mean, it only makes sense if the mean, it makes sense to use the mean, right? So therefore, required condition should be that the distribution of your sample should be either normal or approximately normal, okay? So if data is severely skewed or obviously does not follow the normal distribution, bimodal, trimodal, God forbid, then we cannot really use this technique, hypothesis testing or confidence interval. And remember what we discussed when we just first addressed that issue. We said that for the time being, we're going to just look at the histogram and say, hey, it looks nice, it's a bell-shaped histogram. So this whole agenda that we just developed it applies. Or say, nope, it looks very non-normal, so therefore, it's a, big, it's, a, it's a big question mark if what we did is right. Uh, now, 
This time around, we're going to start actually testing populations or samples for normality, okay? And let me show you how to do that. Well, one thing is, just like before, we can always look at the distribution <laughs> and say a word or two about what we see. So what do you think? Is it a normal distribution or not so much? Normal, the only thing is this valley in the center, right? So if I'm using my judgment, I may say, well, it's just a random fluke, right? <laughs> so really, all these bars jumping up and down, that's just selection of data. That's randomness in my sample, okay? But at the same time, Patrick can say, well, wait a minute. What about all this hoopla that you were talking about, you know, bimodal? That looks bimodal to me because this first peak is high, second peak is high. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a bimodal distribution. And all that stuff that we just did for the hypothesis testing is not really relevant or valid anymore. Okay, so how do we make a distinction? So kind of get rid of the subjectivity. Let's do a couple of things. Okay, thing number one is uh, let's take a look at the normal quantile plot, and it's in the same menu. All right, it's in the same menu. You go to the red triangle menu, and one thing that you will see. <laughs> from the top it says normal quantile plot. Sometimes it's also called QQ plot. Quantile versus quantile plot. Okay? Um, long story short, uh, this plot, if the data that you're dealing with is normal, uh, then the points, right here, are all the points in your data set, okay? And they're plotted against normal distribution. Right? So, uh, you can think of that horizontally. I have points uh, from, from my sample vertically. I have simulated points that come from truly normal distribution. Okay? And there is, if there is a correspondence, then my points, if, the, if my sample is truly normal, then my points should nicely align along the diagonal 45 degrees angle line. Okay? So, what do you think? Do my points follow pretty closely the diagonal? They do, right? And that's basically another informal way to judge if you're looking at the normal distribution or not. If your points follow the diagonal, then you are golden, okay? That means that your sample is normally distributed. It's when you start looking deviations, some weird curvatures in this plot, that's when there, there is a question. Is it really a normal thing, okay? <clears throat> another test, uh, even even more rigorous way to test things is called Shapiro uh, Wilk test. Okay, that's the one that Jump uses. Actually, there is not a single test for the normality. <coughs> Excuse me. There are uh, there are several of them. Okay, there is a Shapiro Wilk test. There is Kolmogorov Smirnov test. And then there is uh, Anderson. Uh, I forgot what's the second gentleman's name. Anderson test for the normality. So there are lots and lots of different flavors okay, of normality tests. So JUMP uses one of them, Shapiro uh, Wilk test. How to do the test? Well, first of all, what is the uh, test about? Okay, so what exactly are we testing? And here in the slides I actually have the same, same pictures. Okay? Uh, all right, so Shapiro Wilk test. Uh, well, first of all, let me show you what it's testing. Okay? Test for normality. Rigorous statistical test for normality. Uh, here is null and alternative in the test. Okay? Null simply states that your sample is normally distributed. So data points, they follow uh, fairly, fairly closely the normal distribution. And alternative is what null is not, right? that the sample is not normally distributed. Remember, we discussed also null is your status quo, right? what makes you feel comfortable and warm about the reality. Okay? And the alternative is the challenging hypothesis, right? Research statement. So if null is true and data are normally distributed, then everything that we discussed applies, right? But if it's not normally distributed, then we have problem Houston, right? So therefore, we don't know really what to do, right? I mean, we can test for the mean formally. Software doesn't care, right? You throw any data at the software, it will generate your p-value, Conclusion, reject null, keep the null, whatever it is, right? It doesn't care, it's just a bunch of numbers. Uh, but we have to, to live with the results, right? How do we interpret them? 
So it's, it's, not, it's not interpretable. All right, uh, and the same rules apply. P-value, we compute the P-value for the test. If P-value is high, we keep the null and declare that the data are normal. If P-value is low, we reject the null and say, nope, sample is not normal. So therefore, all of that that we performed is just a bunch of mumbo jumbo with no point, really, okay? So uh, let's take a look at how the Shapiro-Wilkes test is performed in jump. First thing that I need to do, it's kind of a two-step process, okay? First thing is I need to fit the normal distribution into my uh, histogram, okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means that the um, jump already calculated the mean for me, right? For the sample, the mean 178 and the standard deviation is 68. So it will just fit the normal curve and we will see if normal curve pretty much follows the shape or not. How do we do that? Well, again, Everything that you ever wanted to cal calculate is in the red triangle menu, right? So go to the red triangle and say continuous fit. And I want to fit the normal distribution, okay? Normal distribution, kaboom. And you can see that it plots the red curve over your histogram, which is actually a pretty close fit, right? There are no major deviations between the red curve and the bars on my histogram, okay? Well, that's, that's the first part. Then after that, I have to call up the results of the Shapiro-Wilk uh, test. So right here is my extra piece of analysis in my window. It says fitted normal. And go to the red triangle, and I have to pick the option that says goodness of fit. How well, in other words, this normal curve, the red line, follows the bars of my histogram or my distribution. So I go to the goodness of fit test and what it does, you can see it creates an additional output for me, right? It says Shapiro Wilk W test and the p-value, it doesn't say that uh, it's a p-value, it says probability less than w. w is just statistic that it computes. Okay, on the go. There is a complicated formula behind the scenes, but that's really what it's testing. Okay, so probability less than W is your p-value. So what do we see? P-value is 0 0.1711. So if I go back to my, uh, so normality test, right? Normality test. Normality test. Okay, so now hypothesis is data are normal, correct? Data are normal. Alternative hypothesis, H1, is that data are not normal. And to do the hypothesis test, all I need is a p-value, right? P-value. In my case, it was 0 0.1711. What do, I, what do I compare it against? Against the alpha, right? And let's actually do this. Uh, Whatever alpha we're using for the problem, it can be 5% or 1% or 10%, that's for testing of the mean, okay? But when it comes to normality, let's always use 5%, no matter what we use for the mean, okay? So let's always use alpha, 0 0.05. So p-value is larger than alpha, correct? And what happens when I have large p-value? Keep the null or reject the null? Keep the null, right? So therefore, let's go back to the... Um, oh, well, actually, we don't even have to go back. So, if I keep the null, what does my null say? My null says that the data are statistically normally distributed. Therefore, thank God, I have normal sample, so hypothesis testing and confidence interval apply, right? So, everything that we just did was actually performed correctly. So, technically speaking, I should do the test before I even do the hypothesis, right? Because what if the test would show not normal? And oopsie daisy, all of our thing that we just did, all of these you know conclusions, install new system, it's out of the window, right? So so in jump where it says in the jump um, view here it says notes that normal mm -hmm. the data is, is from the normal is that the is that an automatic conclusion? Yeah. It is. So if it is an automatic conclusion. Yeah, it isn't. But if it was if a, if the p value happened to be less than the significance of would it say <laughs> uh huh. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Like yep. It's a normal curve, right? It's pretty much the same thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So 
Um, you see how nice jump is. It even uh, kind of gives you a hint of the. It gives you the answer, right? So data is from the normal distribution, right there. Okay. So what what we just kind of figured out by comparing p-value against 0 0.05, right? It did already, and it, it gives you the answer. So your data are normal, so therefore we're good to go. Make sense? All right. Any questions about this problem? Concerns? Huh, Patrick? So if the, um, if the note there where it says it is normal, if it wasn't normal, would it say that yeah. it is not normal? Yeah. So if, if the data wouldn't follow the normal, if you fail the test, right, reject the null, then uh, it would say, yep, data is not coming from normal distribution, so be careful, thread carefully, right? All right, so uh, let's do another problem. I'm going to skip all these uh, steps because essentially they repeat what we just did. Revenue management example, that's going to be a little bit more involved, okay, than the previous one because it uses left and right two-tailed uh, test. Many alpine ski centers base their projections of revenue and profits on the assumption that an average person, uh, ski enthusiast, skis four times per year. <coughs> no more than that, no less than that, four times per year. To investigate if this is a valid assumption or not, <laughs> what they do is they take sample, 63 randomly, 63 skiers who visited the resort last year, and ask them how many times they went uh, uh, how many days they skied total uh, in the previous year, okay? Can we infer a 1% significance now that the assumption is incorrect, wrong? So, just like before, even uh, without looking at the data, we should be able to formulate our null and alternative, right? I don't know what the data looks like, and at that point, I don't really care. Tell me where I start, now, now or alternative? Alternative, what am I looking for? Challenging research assumption, right? So tell me what, what's that I'm supposed to be doing. Tell me what to write in the alternative. Um, the mean is less than four. Less than four or greater than four, or not equal? The assumption is that an average person skis four times a year. Not equal, right? So uh, in the null, I should say that on average, people go four, four days a year, right? But alternative would be what null is not, right? So therefore, not equal. So it's either above four or below four, whatever it is, but it's not four, right? So mean not equal to four. That's my alternative. And the null, therefore, becomes mean equals to four. This is what I'm testing. So therefore, it's not a directed test. Note that in the previous problem about the accounts, I was looking for high average account value, right? If it's high account value, then I replace the system. Here, it's not actually looking at any direction. It can be in the right tail on the low side, or on the, on the high side, or on the left tail on the low side. So anything different from four, up or down from four, okay? So it's a two-tailed test. It's not a directional test. All right, so uh, let's open up the uh, data file. I'm going to close this one. I don't have to deal with a lot of them, so skiing. Here is my file, and let's open it up. And there it is. So first things first, actually, let's do the normality test, right? Even before we jump into any hypothesis testing uh, adventure, Let's see if data are normally distributed, because if it's not, then oh boy, are we in trouble. So here's my distribution, number of ski days, and I just call up my analysis, and let's place it in the stack view horizontally, just like so. Well, first of all, visually speaking, does it look like PDN, pretty darn normal distribution to you, or is it horrifyingly bad? Pretty normal, right? So therefore, I suspect my test should reveal that I'm okay with normal distribution. All right, well, let's <coughs> two, take, take two next steps, right? So number one is continuous feed, normal curve. And that's how the normal distribution that fits the best this specific histogram looks like. 
And after that, I have to call up the Shapiro Wilk test, right? So from the red triangle under the fitted normal, I just do the goodness of fit item. And what does it say? Not normal, right? Is that is that no, the conclusion? It's it is. The data is from the normal distribution. Small p values reject now. Because we're at 0 0.99, right? 0.99, yeah, but 0 0.01. 0 0.01, but we never use this assumption here. So apparently the software actually does use 0 0.01 to test the normality, <coughs> right? So the conclusion it, it's hold on, let me go back. The conclusion actually that the data is from the normal distribution, but it's highlighted red. Probably the reason is it kind of sees the borderline value, right? Probably, it's, I, I should check with, with jump. Why, why is it highlighted red? Uh, I'm guessing that it's using 0.01 for the normality test. Uh, so therefore, this value is borderline. So we're kind of on the brink of being not, not exactly normal, right? But it's still treat, treats that as a normal distribution, okay? So let's, let's, let's assume that we're okay to proceed. Even though if I'm using 5% significance, what do I do with 5% significance? Re keep the null, reject the null. If my alpha is 0.05. Null no, rejected. Reject it, right? Because low p value, right? If I reject the null, then I have to say that data are not normal. And then that's the trouble, right? That's the problem. So here, if, you, if we were using 0.01, 1% for the uh, hypothesis test here, then we're going to say, well, it's marginally higher than 1% significance. So therefore, we're keeping the null. We're saying that the data are still normal, even though we're on the brink of actually breaking that rule, right? So that's kind of. How do you change again? How do you go back and change the, the uh, confidence interval? Uh, the uh, confidence uh, for, for the confidence yeah. of, uh, interval. Mm -hmm. uh, you how do you do that? I believe you go to the summary statistics, customize settings, yeah. and right there. You, oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh huh. All right, so we're going to assume that the data are normally distributed and we're good to go. Well, first things first, right? Again, if there is a, a fire, there should be a smoke. So what we're testing is, are they using the wrong assumption? And the average person does not ski four days a year. It's either higher than four or lower than four, right? But that's what we're assuming or uh, suspecting rather, okay? Uh, according to JUMP, the mean uh, in 63 uh, sample, right, 63 is my sample size, uh, the mean number of days that people went for, for skiing last year was 4.46. So it's kind of hard to tell. Is it far enough? It's clearly more than 4, right, uh, above 4.0, <coughs> but this difference, 0.46, is that big enough or not big enough for us to claim the, the difference? Because what can happen is it can be just a spike due to the randomness, right? Anyway, my 63 uh, people that I selected, they're fairly, uh, fairly random, right? I'm assuming that I selected them randomly. So it could be just a random um, fluctuation, right? Numbers, you know, just happen to be on the high side. So therefore, I have to see how likely is that for me. If null is still true, remember null is true, that's how we start testing the hypothesis. If null is still true, how likely is that for me purely randomly to get a sample as extreme as this one? Difference is that this time around, I'm not looking specifically for high values or low values. I'm kind of on the lookout for both, right? So here is how I interpret the p-value graphically in this case, okay? If the average number of days that the Skiing enthusiast goes to the resort is actually four. And that's what my null says, if null is true. Then the distribution of all possible sample averages look will look like that. Agree? But this is how all the X bars are going to look like. <coughs> I took one sample of 63 people and it happened to be on the high side. So therefore, my specific X bar is 
somewhere right here, x bar equals to 4.46, <coughs> right? So therefore, anything above 4.46 is part of my p-value, right? Remember, p-value? How do we interpret the p-value? Tell me. How do I start the phrase? P-value is a interpretation of p-value. P-value is a probability to see something that you see, or even more extreme than that, if now is true, right? So, <laughs> more extreme, in this case, value is even greater than 4.46, right? But, here is the second piece of the puzzle, true or false? If my actual mean is 4, then I'm equally likely to get sample on the high side and sample on the low side, because of <coughs> symmetry, right? Due to the symmetry, right? So, in other words, here I happen to fetch a sample that gives me 4.46. In other words, distance is 0.46. But just as equally likely, I could have gotten a sample on a different side of the fence, right? Because of the symmetry. Because both samples, high and low, are equally likely because the distribution is symmetrical, right? So therefore, it could have been sample which is as well, may as well be 0.46 lower than the average, right? And it's just going to be just as likely as the high one, right? Well, if you go 4 point, uh, no, 0 0.46 <coughs> to the left from 4, what number are you going to get? That seems to be actually 3.54. That's exactly right. And let me give it a little bit longer. Yep, like that. So it could have been 3.54 x bar and just equally likely. Agree? So therefore, my actual p-value, also part of the p-value, is uh, the left tail of the distribution to the left from 3.54. So in my case, the interpretation of the p-value is uh, the likelihood to observe sample average 4.46 or above, or 3.54 or below, if the actual uh, population average is equal to precisely 4. So now my p-value actually consists of uh, left tail of the distribution and the right tail of the distribution taken together. And that's because I'm testing non-directional hypotheses, right? Before that, it was x bar greater than 170. I'm testing for high numbers, so I'm looking in the right tail. If I'm testing x bar or mean, mean less than a certain number, I'm looking in the left tail of the distribution. Here it's equal versus not equal. So I'm not specifically looking for just high or just low numbers. It's both. So therefore, your p-value comes from both tails. Make sense? And that's basically what Christmas is all about. Okay. <laughs> so now let's uh, let's find the, the p-value. That shouldn't be hard, right? Uh, what do I do for that? Well, I go to the uh, red triangle and say test the mean. Okay. Specify the hypothesized mean, that would be what? Four, right? That's, that's in my null, four. Okay, so, and I'm looking for probability greater than t, or less than t, or greater than absolute value of t. If I'm looking for both tails. In other words, greater than absolute value is greater than t, or less than minus t, right? So therefore, I'm looking uh, for, for this part, right? Probability greater than absolute value of t. That's your two-tailed test, okay? <coughs> probability greater than t, it's only right tail of the distribution. Less than t, it's minus, well, wh whatever is missing, right? Kind of in the, in the big left tail of the distribution, but greater than absolute value of t, that gives you both right tail and the left tail. So when I have this non-directed, non-directional hypothesis test, mean equal versus mean not equal, then I'm using this option, greater than absolute value of t, okay? And you can see actually the picture, which is very similar to what we had, right? Uh, left To the left from 4.46 and to the right from 3.54, pretty much what we had on the picture. So my p-value is 0 0.141, uh, yeah, 48. So this area in both tails, 0 0.0148. Now, which alpha are we supposed to use, by the way, in this problem? 
Uh, let's take a look. I believe here I was sneaky. I said use 1% significance level. <laughs> All right, so therefore, <laughs> we have to compare that against alpha 0 0.01. So what do we see? It's greater, right? Uh, P-value is greater than alpha. So therefore, what do we conclude? In terms of hypothesis, do we keep the null or do we reject the null? Keep the null, right? Keep the null. So therefore, this one is, uh, let me put a red X against this one, X. Okay. Times big fat red X. So we fail to reject the null in favor of alternative, right? Therefore, uh, are they using the right assumption? about their projections of the revenue? Looks like that. Or at least we don't have a proof to believe otherwise, right? They may be wrong, but this sample just does not give us enough data to believe otherwise, right? Christian? How do, um, how do we change the thing you mentioned earlier? Do we go to the confidence interval or just change it to 0.99 or 0.95? Oh, uh, this, this part... Uh, it, it, it will give you just a p-value. Confidence interval has little to do with hypothesis testing. Well, if you want to change the alpha then you just compare your p-value against different alpha. That's yeah. pretty much it. Okay. So software will do so much for you. So basically, <laughs> there's no way to do it out there. I'm just checking. Yeah. So, so I should look for. the software will tell you the results of the normality test yeah. automatically, right? Yeah. But not the result of the test test the actual hypothesis test about the mean. So this part is on us, humans. All right, see, see no more. Yeah, this part is on us. So you have to take the p-value, compare it against alpha, say it's small, it's large, so we keep the null, it's, we reject the null, and what does that mean in the business terms? Because, you know, to keep the null, it's like uh, these, these tools that we're learning, they're applied tools, right? So the idea behind them is really, uh, we get the answer in the statistical terms. We reject the null in favor of alternative, or we fail to reject the null in favor of alternative, right? But if, if this is part of your report to your boss, are you planning to show up to him and say, hey, I collected the data, I ran the t-test, and I failed to reject the null. What do you think the next thing he will tell you? He'll tell you, what in the sweet heck does that mean, right? We have to translate that back into the business terms. So in this case, our conclusion, statistical conclusion is p-value is large compared to alpha, so we fail to reject the null in favor of alternative. What does that mean from the business standpoint? From the business standpoint, it means that it looks like the ski centers, they use the correct uh, projection, uh, correct, correct average uh, number of days that the alpine skier goes skiing per year, for their revenue projections, right? Or at least we don't have enough evidence to prove otherwise. So therefore, we're going to stick with our assumption that four days a year is the average. Let's keep using that because it looks like sample does not does not give us evidence to believe otherwise, right? That's the business conclusion in business terms, translated from statistical language, okay? Make sense? And all the slides that follow, they pretty much explain what we just did, okay? All right. Let's uh, take a look at yet another problem, customer service. So I told you that all examples that we're going to use in this class, or a lot of them anyway, are going to be business-related examples. So customer service problem. For the past few years, I like this one kind of. For the past few years, the number of customers at the drive-up bank in New York City averaged to 20 per hour. This year, though, they have competition. Another bank, one mile away, opened a drive-up window. The manager of the first bank believes that this will result in some customers switching over to the competitor and therefore decrease in their business. So competition nearby steals the customers. Okay, uh, so in order to see if this is the case or not, here's what he does. He picks randomly 36 hours, almost the entire week, right, 40-hour week, out of operations, so randomly, just some, some hours in the morning, some hours in the afternoon, in the, in, in the evening, so mix and match them, right? And he basically records how many customers 
come through the drive up window during these selected 36 random hours. Okay? And the data are recorded in the file bank. Can we conclude at 5% significance level that the manager is correct? Correct about what? what what's he suspecting? Yeah, so some customers are leaving us, right? So now we see less of the customer stream. And again, just like I did before, without even looking at the data, let's write down hypothesis that we're testing, right? So now, and the alternative, H1, I start with alternative, right? What should I write in my alternative? That the average number of customers driving through my bank decreased from from 20, right? So now it's less than 20, right? That is an indication of problem, right? If that's the case, that is an indication that in fact the competitor bank is stealing some customers away from me. Okay, red flag. Otherwise, if it's still greater than or equal to 20, then it's all good, right? That's a status quo. That's what makes the manager happy. Make sense? Okay, so this is what I'm testing. All right. Now let's take a look at the data. Now that we have formulated what exactly we're testing, let's take a look at the bank data. So here's your file. Let's open it up. 36 hours. So during hour one, 21 customer came in. That's good, right? More than 20, then 23, then 17, then 19. So I have a mixture of different numbers, right? All right, so uh, let's do the histogram and all the preliminary numbers, right? So first of all, here's my histogram. Does it look pretty normal to you or is it horrifyingly bad? Pretty normal, right? So it passes the visual test, so to speak. Now let's do the uh, actual test of normality, right? So let's go to the customers and continuous feed. Let's fit the normal curve. That's what the normal curve is going to look like. It follows the shape fairly closely, right? So I believe this is a pretty good fit. Now let's test how good this fit actually is, right? So I go to the fitted normal, just like I did before, and I do the goodness of fit test right there. And uh, <coughs> for the data to be normal, Am I looking for high p-values or low p-values? Let's go back to the normality test that we had before. Um, where is it? is it? This one? Yeah, this one. Remember, here is what a normality test looks like. My null hypothesis is data are normal and alternative data are not normal. So right now, I wish all of my data to be normal, right? So therefore, I should have null hypothesis to be true, statistically, right? So for, for me to keep the null and not reject it, do I have to have high p-value or low p-value? High p-value, right? So therefore, if I have high p-value for the normality test, that's a good thing for me, right? That means that normality is in effect. 0.468. Is it high enough? It's higher than anything we can use, right? What kind of alpha levels do we use? Well, it can be either 1% if it's a rigorous test, or 5% if it's the standard thing, or 1% if it's like relaxed, not so rigorous test, right? But that's typically, I mean, we, we don't use anything above 0.1 for the alpha. So 0.46 beats 0.1, right? So therefore, high p-value. Null stays, and null says that my data are normally distributed. So therefore, I can use the t-test for the hypothesis testing, right? Well, first of all, let's, again, if we suspect the fire, there should be a smoke, right? What are we suspecting? We're suspecting that our competition is stealing away customers, right? So therefore, my mean dropped from 20. Well, my x-bar, if that's the case, my x-bar should confirm my suspicions, right? <coughs> so let's go to the x-bar. What does my x-bar say? 19.27. So, do I have a number that kind of points me towards my alternative hypothesis and say, yeah, you might be right about that. Yep, X bar less than 20, right? So, now let's, uh, let's do things graphically, just like we did before, right? 
I start hypothesis testing by believing that the null is true, right? And if the null is true, the average is still 20, right? So therefore, if I'm still believing the null, which I am at the beginning of my hypothesis testing, the average rate of incoming customers per hour should be 20 people per hour, right? And therefore, all of samples of size 36, in my case, they will be distributed like that. That is my sampling distribution. Distribution of all possible samples averages of size 36, right? I got one specific sample which happened to be on the low side, right? It's right here. So my X bar happened to be 19.27 approximately, right? Remember the definition of the p-value. P-value is a probability to see what you see, or even more extreme, if null is true. Where are the more extreme values? To the left. I'm looking for low numbers, right? So therefore, 19.27 uh, is kind of low for me, right? Or even lower anything to the, right, to the left, okay? So therefore, my p-value is the left tail of the distribution. Here is the p-value. So it is a directed test, correct? All right, so how do we find it? Uh, let's take a look. So what I do is go to the red triangle, right, and I test the mean, okay, hypothesis mean is what, 20, and when I click OK, it gives me the stuff, and now I'm looking, uh, and, and of course, I mean, jump understands what, which tail you're looking for, right, kind of, because uh, I'm testing 20, and my X bar is 19.27 so clearly I'm looking in the in the left tail of the distribution so probability less than t right that's my p value right there okay and you can you can see that this is the right number because that that tail is supposed to be small relatively speaking right relatively small so therefore between these two 0 0.0723 and 0.9277 that's your p-value, right, in the, in, the, in the left tail of the distribution, okay? And the probability greater than absolute value of t gives you right and left tail. So that's when your hypothesis is equal versus not equal, right? So my p-value is right there, less than t, 0 0.0723. All right, p-value 0 0.0723. Uh, what am I comparing it against? What level of alpha significance? 5%, right? Does it say in the problem that we have to use 5%? Yeah, it does, 5%. Good. So, 5% significance, what do, we, what do we have? Versus 0 0.05, p-value is larger than my alpha significance, right? What happens if the p-value is higher than alpha? Do we keep the null or do we reject the null? Keep the null, fail to reject it, right? So therefore, coming back to my formulation, here, I keep the null, I fail to reject it. So over here, again, I have to change my peak, <laughs> right? So big fat cross against my alternative, and I'm keeping the null. So my conclusion in statistical language is we fail to reject the null in favor of alternative, right? Or Samples collected does not provide sufficient evidence to conclude that the null is false, right? I'm still believing that the null is the case. I started believing in null, and I don't have evidence to stop believing in null. So null is still, null still holds. What does that imply in terms of competition? Because the question is, right, I suspect that competition is stealing away money. Do I have evidence to support that claim? What do you think? If competition was in fact stealing the customers, which hypothesis would I find to be the case? Null or alternative? Alternative, right? 
I didn't find supporting evidence for alternative, right? So I still believe the null. So do I have enough statistical reasons to worry about competition? No, not really. It seems to be that way based on my X bar, right? Point, uh, what, what, what was it? 19.27, right? It seems like it went down from 20. But in actuality, that was could, could have been just a random selection of my 36 hours, right? So it was on the low side because of randomness in my data collection, right? So the, the uh, value that I observed, this 19.27, is fairly consistent with the 20 average. Okay, samples like that are not rare. They happen in seven point something, whatever p-value is, right? Percent of the cases. Okay, so it's not very rare. It's consistent with 20. So therefore, I claim that I I I don't have enough evidence to say that competition is actually affecting my business and stealing away the customers. Make sense? Uh huh. Christian. Um, I I got that. But I'll just when it says the probability that it's less than W for the, uh, the normal uh -huh. Shapiro test, yeah. what exactly does that 0 0.468 mean? Because I thought you referred to that as the p-value earlier. Yeah, that, that's the p-value, right? That's the p-value for the normality oh, test. Oh, for the normality test. Right, not for our yeah. test. Here's the p-value for our test, for the mean, and that's the p-value for normality test. Because remember, we're doing really two tests, right? One for normality, just to make sure that we can proceed with our actual test, primary test, and then the other one is our real test, p-value, okay? A lot of textbooks in statistics, quite honestly, they don't go into this area. So it's just my custom to, to do the testing because, you know, I don't like subjectivity. So somebody will look, well, this histogram is nice, but the one that we had a couple of problems ago, like by model two peaks, Somebody says it's normal, somebody says it's not normal. Where do we go from there? So I like to run one of the statistical tests for normality so that software can tell me, yes, this thing is normal or this thing is not normal. So it's kind of a clear-cut decision. Uh -huh. Do you have another question? Should we, should we always graph the, uh, the diagonal test as well? Oh, the, uh, yeah, it's actually a good idea. I, I was kind of skipping that step, right? Uh, the QQ plot, right? Normal, normal uh, quantile plot, yeah. So what do you think? It's pretty good overall, right? Except on the low end, I have some weird thing, right? But that's only three points, right? But other than that, they follow the, uh, the line pretty, pretty nicely, right? So it looks PDN pretty darn normal, okay? And this test, uh, quite honestly, the QQ plot or uh, normal uh, quantile plot. I'm not also a big fan of this because it's not that far away from just visually inspecting your histogram, right? Mm -hmm. Because here we, we don't test it rigorously. We just say, do they align along the diagonal or do they not? Well, in this case, likely they do. What if there are some deviations, you know, some curvatures, like this one, for example, at the end? Is that bad enough for me to claim that things are not normal? Or what if I have like, a curve right here. It's not going exactly like a straight line, but it's not a severely, you know, severely curved pattern. At what point do I start saying, yeah, they don't look normal? So again, it's a visual inspection. Okay? If it's normal, you will see it, but if it's not, it's just different shades of non-normality, so to speak, right? Where do you draw the line? It's not quite clear. All right, so I believe we have enough time to do our last problem okay so I'm going to scroll over to the problem through the slides this one okay to realize that what we did today was primarily about testing of the mean mean greater than a number mean less than a number mean not equal to a number and that applies to uh, samples populations of numerical or continuous data Okay, but uh, of course not all the data are numerical, right? In fact, I would probably make an argument that the majority of the data that businesses are dealing with comes from categorical variables, okay? So, uh, what do we do when the data are categorical? Same principle applies, okay? We formulate now, we formulate alternative. Uh, the only difference is that 
we do not have the mean anymore for categorical data. Remember, we discussed when data are nominal or ordinal, there is no mean, right? You cannot compute the mean. What can we compute? The only thing that we can compute are proportions, right? Percentages of people who voted for a Republican candidate. Percentage of people who voted for a Democratic candidate. Percentage of people who received gift cards for Christmas from, from their friends and relatives, right? So we can compute proportion for, which is the same thing, percentages, okay? So same thing, really. We formulate the null and the alternative, but we're testing proportions. But uh, again, we calculate the p-value. Again, we um, uh, compare the p-value against significance level. We keep the null or reject the null. The only thing that we do not do is, guess what? Which test do we not perform? The normality test, Shapiro, exactly. Why? Because there is no normality for the... Normality applies only for, no, uh, uh, for numerical data, for continuous data, right? There is no such thing as normality for nominal data, and there is no such thing as normality for uh, ordinal data as well, okay? So this test is somewhat easier to do because normality, we don't have to worry about that because this issue doesn't even come up, okay? There is no such thing as normally distributed ordinal data. There are no means, there are no standard deviations, none of that stuff applies, okay? All right, so let's uh, take a look at this problem. State Farm Insurance Company says that at least 90% of their customers who file insurance claims with them are quite satisfied with how the claim has been resolved. <laughs> the company uh, that conducts the annual claim, so it's a watchdog, right? Uh, conducts the annual claimant satisfaction survey, uh, their, their job is uh, to find uh, wrong statements, right, and disprove some claims. Okay, so they're, they're skeptical about that. So they're saying, your claim is that at least 90% of people are satisfied with your service. I think it's, you're being too optimistic, my friends, okay? So uh, they conduct their own survey. Uh, and uh, they pick people who filed claims with the State Farm Insurance and ask them, did you file a claim in the last year with State Farm Insurance? And if you did, can you please tell us, uh, are you okay with how they handled that with the settlement that you received, or are you not okay? So every person is recorded as one, satisfied, two, unsatisfied. Here is the punchline, right? Can we conclude at 5% significance level that satisfaction rate is less than 90%? In other words, they were skeptical about this statement, right? At least 90% are okay with how the claim is settled. So therefore, can we conclude that State Farm Insurance is way too optimistic, or maybe they're just not, not, not telling us the, 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 true, the true story, right? So again, before I even look at the data, oops, let's formulate null and alternative. Okay, so here is my null, and here is my alternative. Okay, which one do I start with, null or alternative? Alternative, right? So they're, they're skeptical. Therefore, what they're saying, that the percentage of people who said satisfied is what? Greater. 90 or greater, that's what the company says, right? It says at least 90%. That means 90 or greater, that's what the company says. But that watchdog organization, they're skeptical about that. So... They're saying that the actual less than 90, right? And how do we say 90% in terms of proportions? 0 0.9, right? So proportion of people who said, I am satisfied with how the company handled my claim, proportion of satisfied customers, is less than 0 0.9. That's the analog of less than 90%. So therefore, opposite of um, alternative would be proportion of people who are satisfied, is greater than or equal to 0.9, right? 0 0.9. This is what I'm testing. Okay? That's what Christmas is really all about. Okay. Well, let's download the data. And that's going to be the last problem for today. After that, I'm going to have to do the homework. Okay? Insurance. And I'm going to close all the extra windows here and open up the insurance file. And there it is. Okay, so uh, 
I have 177 customers that I placed in the survey, correct? All right, well, there is not much to do but to plot the uh, distribution of my answers. So I go to the distribution and put satisfied column right there, and there it is. Let me put it horizontally in the step format. Okay, so it looks like, based on this sample alone, right, uh, out of 177 people who were surveyed, 153 said that they are quite all right with how the claim was uh, settled by the insurance company. And that represents 86.441% of all people surveyed, right? So, again, uh, when you suspect a fire, there should be smoke, right? What we suspect is people in the insurance company are overly optimistic about how good of the job they're doing, right? And do we, do we find, do we, did we find kind of a confirmation pointing maybe towards alternative hypothesis in our sample? So we suspect that their actual satisfaction rate, and that, by the way, should be, uh, sorry, let me change that. What am I testing? The proportion from the sample or the proportion from all people? <coughs> no, from all people. I'm testing actually something that I don't know, right? I'm testing the proportion of all people who filed claim with insurance. But I don't know all of the data. I don't have it, right? So therefore, I'm using the hypothesis test, okay? If I knew exact proportion in the entire population, I don't need to test anything. I have it, right? But I don't, so therefore, really, I'm testing uh, this one, right? The proportion in the, in the, uh, of, of people who are satisfied with how the claim was resolved in the entire population, pi, okay? Not, not the P in the sample, but pi in the population. Just like I did uh, for all the problems before, right? I didn't test X bar, I test the mu, the mean, number that I will never ever know with certainty, okay? We're testing population parameter. It's either mean or the proportion. In that case, it's proportion, okay? So, coming back to the um, to the analysis window. I suspect that their actual percentage of people who are satisfied is less than 90. And my sample says that among 177 customers that I surveyed, it's actually 86.44, less than 90. So if I didn't know statistics, what would I say? That's it, you're lying, right? You say it's 90 or more, and I, say, I see 86.44. So you are telling me the lie. Now, of course, that claim is based on just a sample, right? What's the likelihood of that proportion to be actual percentage of people, everybody who, who, who filed a claim with State Farm Insurance? The likelihood of that is zero, right? I pick a different sample, it's a different proportion. I pick another sample, it changes again, right? So I need to find out if now is true, and what they're saying is actually 0.9 or more, how likely is that for me to observe that specific sample, right, that has the proportion of 86.44% or less? So therefore, let me uh, draw again a picture, right? Picture that explains what's going on in that specific problem. So here it is. Uh, all proportions, well, first of all, it cannot be any less than zero or it cannot be, not be any greater than one, correct? Zero means nobody is happy with your service. One means everybody is happy. No questions about that. You're doing a great job, right? But what they're saying, what the State Farm Insurance uh, is saying, is they are at least at 0.9 level right there, right? So they're saying my proportion of customers who are happy, right? So proportion of satisfied clients is 0.9 at least, or more. Well, let's say it's 0.9, okay? If it's 0.9, that means that uh, it should follow the binomial distribution, right? Number of customers who filed a claim and it was resolved to their satisfaction. And therefore, all proportions should be distributed something like that. Remember, we looked at the picture and found that normal, uh, the, the binomial distribution starts to look pretty darn normal, right? For high N, number of customers, 
in high proportions, right? So therefore, it should look something like that. Uh, I found in my specific sample of 177 people that proportion of P hat satisfied customers is kind of on the low side, right? It is what, 0.864 for one, I believe, if I remember correctly, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, what should I do? Where, where is my p-value and what tail? Remember, p-value is the probability to see what you see in the sample, or even more extreme than that, if the null is true. Well, if the null is true, it's right here. The peak is 0.9, right? That's what if the null is true means for, for me in that problem, right? I found things to be on the low side, 0.86441. So I'm looking at the left tail, agree? Because more extreme values would be even smaller than that, right? I'm, I was suspecting small values, and it indeed happened. 0.86441 is on the low side. Even smaller than that would be even more extreme, right? So therefore, my p-value is in the left tail of the distribution. So here is my p-value, okay? That's what happens graphically. And now all I have to do really is to go ahead and find the actual p-value, right? And conclude the test. Well, there is nowhere to go but over here, okay? In the red triangle. Test probabilities. Okay. So it's a little bit uh, different from, uh, from the mean, right? It says... Uh, which probability are you testing? For satisfied customers for, or for unsatisfied customers? For satisfied, right? Mm -hmm. And what's hypothesized probability in the null? That would be 0.9, agree? And then it says, well, you have to select one of three options. Probability is not equal. That would be alternative, right? Probability greater than what you hypothesize or probability less than. So I should pick my alternative. What, what's my alternative look like? So that my, my alternative is satisfied probability is less than a number, right? Less than 0.9. Okay, so probability less than the hypothesized value. I pick option number three and I say done. And right there is my p-value, ladies and gentlemen. How do you like them apples? Pretty straightforward, right? How to use this. Okay, 0 0.0774. So my p-value, 0 0.0774. And what uh, significance do I compare that against? Does it say in the problem? Yes, it does. Can we conclude that 5% significance? So the uh, borderline between my low probabilities and high probabilities, 0 0.05, right? So alpha is 0 0.05, and my p-value clearly is greater than alpha. So what do I do? Keep the null or fail, or, or reject the null? I keep the null, right? So I don't say keep, I, I say fail to reject. Well, it's the same thing really, right? Fail to reject the null. Okay? And what does my null say? My null says that, uh, let's see, hold on. my null says that proportion of satisfied customer is 0.9 or 90% or more, right? And that's pretty much what the company was saying to begin with, right? So, coming back to the original question. If we are this watchdog, right, annual claim and satisfaction survey organization, and we collect that sample, and we did this analysis. Can we uh, claim that company is lying or mis misrepresenting the facts? No, not really, right? That would be alternative hypothesis, right? But we didn't find in favor of alternative because our p-value was large. So therefore, we're saying, well, sample that we have received as the result of this survey is consistent with 90% being the true proportion of satisfied customers. So we don't have a proof to claim that you guys are misrepresenting facts or lying. What we see is fairly consistent with what you're saying. So therefore, your claim, your, your claim stands. We don't have enough evidence to reject that, okay? 
So in spite of our best efforts, we couldn't catch them lying, right? Our sample just does not, does not provide us any foundation or evidence to say that they're not telling the truth. Okay? Make sense? All right. Uh, in the homework, I believe you have two problems. And I don't remember what these problems are, to be honest with you. So let's go to uh, uh, to, to Scholar, Homework Assignments. Yeah, one is about smoke breaks. That's a problem with smokers. When they go to smoke outside, that's basically lost productivity for company, right? <laughs> so can we uh, alleviate the problem by installing special rooms so that they don't have to leave the building? Maybe they'll spend more time at the work desk. Okay, and another is light bulbs. It's about how, uh, um, how what's, what's the lifetime of a bulb, okay? Can we say that it's more than 5,000 hours or not? All right, so tomorrow uh, we're going to start by going over the homework, and after that we're going to take a look at the chi-square distribution and also start getting into the uh, two uh, population test, okay? All right, this is it for today, so I'll see you tomorrow.